Hello, my name is Lauren and welcome to the Theoretical YouTube channel where I was waiting to make this video until it became topical again and boy did it ever. The first Harry Potter book, The Philosopher's Stone, was published on June 26, 1997. The first movie premiered on November 14, 2001. In between that time, the next three Harry Potter books had been published and the following behind this series had exploded. Millions of readers were enthralled by the world of the boy who lived and desperate for more content. More books, movies, merchandise, a play, a prequel series were all in the future of this franchise. And yet, in these four years, a huge percentage of the die-hard fanbase had been incorrectly pronouncing one of the main character's first names. Hermione Granger. That is my name. Oh, well then, there you go. <laughs> For my one? <laughs> <laughs> this was such a widespread inaccuracy that a year before the first film would premiere, J.K. Rowling found a way to slip in a phonetic spelling of Hermione into Goblet of Fire. This was the precise moment that the creator of the series took a stand and decided that Hermione's name would be canonically pronounced as intended. But does that mean that she retroactively changed the truth of the Harry Potter series for so many of her fans? Did J.K. Rowling have to write in a phonetic spelling of the name Hermione in order to make that pronunciation canon? Or were some of her readers just not getting it in the first place? What even is Harry Potter canon? Philosophically, what this question boils down to is how do we acknowledge truth in fiction? If this world doesn't even exist, then how could any given fact be true or false? Why are statements like Harry Potter goes to Hogwarts true when neither Harry Potter nor Hogwarts really exist? But logically, as readers, we know that there is truth in fiction, that statements like Neville's toad is named Trevor are true, whereas Neville's toad is named Scabbers are false. But what does it actually take to know for sure that any given statement about a fictional world is a fact or canon within its own narrative? Now, if you're wondering why I'm starting with a philosophical approach here, it's because one of the very first classes I took at college was an intro to philosophy course through the lens of Harry Potter. Coincidentally, it was also the last philosophy course I will ever take. Its unofficial name was Metaphysics for Muggles, and that is the beauty of a liberal arts education. And one of the topics we covered was this exact question. In fact, I wrote my final paper on it. How do we reconcile the ideas of truth and fiction? And obviously I care about Harry Potter for more than just the grade. This is the question that my brother and I have to ask ourselves when we sit down to write a theory. Theories are based on evidence, and evidence can only be facts, but when the content is at war with itself, sometimes it's hard to tell what's actually a viable option for theory fodder. If the Harry Potter movies are not canon because they deviate too much from the books, does that discredit their identity as part of the franchise? And what about the Fantastic Beasts films? Their movies too, but not really based on any original source material. But they also have characters from the original series. But then there are issues with timelines not matching up, like McGonagall's appearance in Crimes of Grindelwald. But then again, all of McGonagall's backstory is from essays and articles written by J.K. Rowling, but over a decade after the last book was published. If only the books are canon, then why do these articles hold more credence than the Fantastic Beast films? And if you argue it's because the article information came first, well then you have to admit that no part of Harry Potter canon can ever be retroactively changed. Even though publishing new information and the production of the prequels in the first place are both examples of adding or trying to change previously explored canon. See, it's complicated. And that's excluding the single most divisive installment in the franchise, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Is it canon because it doesn't actively contradict main series information like Fantastic Beasts? Or is it not canon because it's a play and not a book? Is it not canon because J.K. Rowling didn't write it herself? even though she's given her own seal of approval? Or is it not canon because fans don't like it? Or do fans not like it because it doesn't fit with their idea of what Harry Potter canon is? Okay, 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 let's, let's back up for a second. Section one, death of the author. 
Perhaps the narrowest view on canonicity or truth in fiction is the literary concept called death of the author. In other words, the only acceptable truths about a text are the ones written down. After the author is done writing, they die. They have no more authority over what happens to the characters or how the work should be interpreted. And if the author does try to add more information, their statements don't have any more significance than that of any other fans. It's like tangential fanfiction or headcanon, just approved by the same person who originally created the world in the first place. Through this lens, the only official Harry Potter canon is from the original seven books. So statements like Harry Potter wears glasses, Ron has has five brothers, and Hermione got a 320% on a Muggle Studies exam are all true. And yet, truth can't just be what's written on the page. Point to the passage in the text where it says that Hermione Granger doesn't have six fingers on her left hand. Where in the text does it say that Voldemort wasn't best friends with Rubius Hagrid? So then why are these statements incorrect? Why can't we just fill in between the lines with whatever we want? Why can't 2 plus 2 equal 6 in the world of Harry Potter? Why do we assume that gravity works the same as in our world? Well, because it would be a significant thing to leave out of the story, right? Section 2. World Building The world of Harry Potter is so similar to our own that unless it's directly contradicted, we can pretty much just transfer information from our world into this one. For instance, while magic clearly doesn't exist in our world, we can assume that taxes still exist in theirs, or at least in the muggle world of Harry Potter. The world building aspects of the Harry Potter world are dictated by the differences from the world that the readers experience every day. J.K. Rowling had to write about house elves and goblins and dragons dragons and murder people to populate her world because they do not appear in ours. She didn't have to write about the planet Neptune, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, or the Grand Canyon for us to assume that these things still exist, even if they aren't relevant to the story. In other words, we had to be told that Harry's scar was in the shape of a lightning bolt. We didn't have to be told that scars don't heal. We can assume that Hermione has ten fingers, and that Voldemort was not best friends with Hagrid, because these would be significant details to leave out. So Death of the Author covers both the fact that what's written is written, and that we can fill in some of the blanks with reasonable assumptions. What it does not condone is authorial intention. And oh man, does J.K. Rowling have some authorial intentions. Section 3. Retroactive Canon Adjustments The thing about Death of the Author is that very few authors truly subscribe to this idea. And that makes sense. If I'm expected to create a logically consistent and entertaining world that serves as a partial allegory for real-world issues, then I'm gonna want my opinion to mean something. Whether we acknowledge it or not, authors pretty much always have intentions. And J.K. Rowling is no exception. It's not a coincidence that J.K. Rowling is an outspoken fem- <clears throat> mm. Maybe that's not the best title right now. And that the Harry Potter franchise is filled with well-written, complex female characters. It's not controversial to say that blood purity in this franchise is not at least a partial allegory for racial or class divides. Mudblood is a fictional slur because it has real-world counterparts that affect real people and real cultures. Rowling's perspective of the real world is woven into the very fabric of the franchise that she created. In her own words, I wanted Harry to leave our world and find exactly the same problems in the wizarding world. But J.K. Rowling's opinions about what she has written has never stopped with what is written on the page. And this has put her in the hot seat a few times, especially in recent years. But even before the toxic climate that we find ourselves in today, Rowling was already adding new information to the franchise from outside of the books. Before Twitter and the Fantastic Beast films and the Cursed Child, or even Pottermore or the original J.K. Rowling website, there was the infamous Carnegie Hall interview. In 2007, shortly after the last Harry Potter book was published, and before I myself had read the first, in a Q&A session, Rowling revealed that she had, quote, always thought of Dumbledore 
as gay. And so the face case of the debate was born. Is J.K. Rowling allowed to add to the Harry Potter canon outside of the Harry Potter books? Because nothing gets people's blood boiling like arguing over the sexual preferences of an old fictional dead guy whose personal relationships never affected the plot in any way. Well. Dumbledore was always very private, even as a boy. Obviously, this was the big controversial issue to come out of the interview, but on the same night, Rowling also said, Neville Longbottom married Hannah Abbott, the Horcrux in Harry Potter wasn't destroyed by the Basilisk because Fox's tears came so soon, Snape has a portrait in the headmaster's office, and that quote about Harry encountering real-world problems. None of that information has ever been in the books, and None of it has ever really been controversial. No one ever cared about information as innocuous as who Neville married because it never had any bigger cultural weight implications. But Albus Dumbledore being the first, and as far as I'm aware, only representation from the LGBTQ community in the Harry Potter series, well, let's just say that people cared on both sides. And I'm guessing that you can guess which side suddenly started advocating for a certain literary concept. One that would maybe discredit Rowling's ability to make judgment calls on statements made outside her published works. The cry for the death of the author had begun. And yet, J.K. Rowling never did quite stop adding to the world she created, did she? Not only are there dozens of Pottermore articles explaining the details of everything from lycanthropy and alchemy to Scottish rugby and 1920s Wizarding America, but the Fantastic Beasts films are going to be a five-film installment in the franchise that covers the Grindelwald Dumbledore backstory. Plus beasts, I guess. And then there's Twitter. Most recently, uh, having to do with explicitly Harry Potter content, J.K. Rowling was met with a less than enthusiastic response when she tweeted that wizards used to pee their pants and then vanish away the waste. In 2018, she received backlash on two fronts for revealing that Nagini had once been a woman and had since transformed into a snake. Some accused her of racism for casting a Korean actress to play what would eventually become a subservient evil character. And some people just refused to believe that she had kept this secret reveal for 20 years. Especially since Nagini hadn't actually been a Harry Potter character until the fourth book. And then there's the controversy around Native American wizards from back in 2016 when she discredited part of a entire culture's belief system in order to flesh out some of her shaky world building. And of course, then there's the Cursed Child, specifically how J.K. Rowling handled the casting of Hermione Granger. In 2015, it was announced that Hermione Granger would be played by a black actress, an obvious departure from the film adaptations. Will you stop eating? Great, cool, representation in media is awesome. But Rowling uh, may have taken her support a little too far. She tweeted the following quote, Canon, brown eyes, frizzy hair, very clever. White skin was never specified. Except that it, it was. After that comment, the internet dug through the Harry Potter books to find instances of Hermione's face being described as pale, and early concept art drawn by Rowling herself depicting Hermione with light skin like even standing next to an early adaptation of Dean Thomas. And even though it's not quite what she meant, many Harry Potter fans took this quote to mean that Rowling believed that Hermione could have been black the whole time. But the thing is, Dumbledore being gay, Hermione being black, and Nagini being a Korean woman have all been criticized for the same reason. Going back and retroactively changing information about your characters doesn't mean that you actually have representation in your content. In fact, a lot of the time it actually just draws attention to how little representation these marginalized groups actually had in the first place. The question is, if you had always thought that a character had a specific trait, why didn't you just write them like that in the first place? And if it's just because you wanted to gain extra brownie points after the fact without offending your wider audience with the initial publication, I, I, I guess that's a political move? I'll let you draw your own conclusion, but just know that back in that 2007 interview, after the crowd's shock about the Dumbledore revelation, Rowling responded by commenting, If I had known it would make you so happy, I would have announced it years ago. 
But what about when that response isn't so happy? Section four, the arrest of the JK Rowling Twitter controversy. There are two reasons JK Rowling gets in trouble on Twitter. One, she makes a controversial statement about the world of Harry Potter. Two, she tweets something vaguely transphobic. And lately, well, it hasn't been so vague anymore. As of writing this video, the most recent JK Rowling controversy has been around a series of tweets that she made a couple weeks ago. After posting a thread and a link to a longer essay, which conveniently has comments disabled, JK Rowling seems to have finally placed the straw that broke the camel's back. A huge percentage of the Harry Potter fandom has turned its back on its creator and rejected her ideology. Most notably are many of the Harry Potter actors, including Emma Watson, Daniel Radcliffe, Bonnie Wright, Ivana Lynch, and Katie Leung. But the true outrage has come from the fans loyal, die-hard fans who feel personally betrayed by the heinous, hurtful words shared by J.K. Rowling. Let me make this clear. I believe J.K. Rowling is wrong. I believe trans women are women. I am not boycotting Harry Potter forever. But on the other hand, how does the fandom's outrage at its own creator affect canon? In my final paper for my philosophy class, I wrote the following conclusion. I personally believe that Rowling's power to dictate truth in her fiction derives from our trust in her as a mediator. If every individual's version of Harry Potter was technically true, then any contradiction between readers could not be settled. However, because a large majority of fans do trust Rowling to make logical decisions based on her deep understanding of the series, we have elected her as an authority to keep the consistency of her creation. Her power to make decisions directly stems from our faith in her judgment. If one day she begins to make enough claims to alienate a majority of her audience, her credibility could be damaged enough to shake her position, and an outraged fanbase would be justified in rejecting her authority over canonicity. But so long as her audience generally trusts her judgment, Rowling remains the most powerful factor in determining what's true about the Wizarding World. Her interpretation of the series is the single most credible source of knowledge about the world of Harry Potter, its characters, and its laws of nature. For now. Has J.K. Rowling officially violated the trust that she had built up with her fandom enough to corrode her authority over Harry Potter? If we can't trust her ability to make sound judgment calls on statements made outside of them, maybe the Harry Potter books really are the only Harry Potter canon. But really, the decision is ours as fans. For years, people have rejected the Cursed Child as canon for a variety of reasons. Some say it's because it's not one of the original books, or by the original author, or because they just don't like it. But I'd argue that what's kept the Cursed Child from being accepted into the canon is the fact that the play itself is not logically consistent with the series. Fans know that the time travel in the story does not make sense with the rules for time travel already established in the franchise. Fans know that the characters that we've grown to love would never behave the way they do in the play. Despite being approved by the supposed universal authority over Harry Potter canon, the Cursed Child has never quite been canon because the fans didn't approve it. For over 20 years, the Harry Potter fandom has relied on J.K. Rowling as a mediator over headcanon. But clearly, we don't need her all the time. After all, her most controversial statements have nothing to do with the fictional lore of her universe. It's more about not understanding our world. Perhaps she'd either have to forget something particularly important or try to add something just so ridiculous that the fans would finally reject it. But it does beg the question. If everyone suddenly decided that it didn't matter what was written into the books or said in the movies, and that a certain name was actually pronounced Hermione Granger, would that invoke death of the author? Could the fans kill the author themselves? Just to be clear, I meant figuratively kill the idea of the author. You guys get it. I mean, the, the literary term is called death of the author and I was trying to be clever. Anyway, today's video is a little bit more serious than usual. Many people were hurt by the words of JK Rowling and I really wanted my message to do two things. Explore the interesting nuances to the idea of truth and fiction. Inform people that you can, in fact, 
at least partially separate art from artists, even if there is strong authorial intention behind the writing. In many ways, Harry Potter has always belonged to the fans more than the author, and I hope that people will still continue to find what they've always loved in the series. Even if it's problematic, it's not worthless. And now for the obligatory self-promotion portion of the outro. If you liked this video, please subscribe to the channel for tons of Harry Potter content. You can physically like this video if you enjoyed or want more of this kind of longer form, non-theory related videos. You can also follow us on Twitter at theory underscore central, where I assure you we are yet to start any sort of scandal or controversy. I mean, it's a little hard with only 13 followers, three of which are our parents. But anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you later. Just something to think about. Now off to bed. Hip hip.